Raki, please take it forward and looking forward for a fantastic session altogether. Uh, thank you very much, Indranil, and uh, thank you, CMA, for inviting me. Uh, it's always, uh, I have a soft corner, uh, honestly, uh, for Calcutta or Kolkata, as we call it, uh, because I, when I was uh, in Calcutta, I did part of my schooling in Calcutta, actually. Uh, I was in La Martina for boys, and uh, so I have very fond memories of my years in Kolkata, and uh, very good memories, actually. So whenever I go back, um, I get nostalgic. Uh, so I, I take every opportunity when I can to go back to Calcutta, actually. Uh, so today's topic, you know, what you all have got, CMA has got this uh, leadership in turbulent times. I think you all are running this series where you get different speakers to come and speak. I think it's a very relevant uh, topic, considering where the world is and the where we are. And what I'm going to talk is uh, leadership with purpose. Uh, you know, basically for me, higher purpose has been very close to my heart. It is something um, which um, drives me, which gets me to get up in the morning and do what I do. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to, uh, you know, when we talk of higher purpose uh, is what actually lives in our true self, who we are. And uh, it is beyond the realm of the mind, what the mind can conceive. It's much beyond it. And if I have to explain it in simple terms to anybody, uh, if your salary is your current account, your higher purpose is your capital account. And once we understand that uh, aspect of it, we will know uh, what higher purpose. As we go through this presentation, uh, as we go through this uh, conversation I'm going to have with you, I think it'll get more clearer. But before I get into the topic, I think it's good to know where, where we stand in the world today. The uh, COVID has had an impact on health and lives of people. Uh, <clears throat> India is still awaiting for the third wave. Uh, we don't know where, where we are. Of course, we are much better prepared than what we were when the second wave happened. Uh, but I hope that preparedness continues because we don't know when it when at all it will come. <clears throat> It's also had a huge economic crisis. Uh, the economy has been badly hit, not only in India, but globally. Even before COVID came, actually, the world was in disruptive mode. You know, the VUCA, which we all know, uh, was impacting every single leadership decision, all corporates, because of the way technology had, uh, had pervaded our lives and it become so pervasive. In fact, I was listening to somebody who said uh, that the new oxygen is actually Wi-Fi uh, is, uh, uh, you know, if you don't have Wi-Fi, you literally can't work today. And it is proved, this was before COVID, he said it. And during COVID, it proved that without, if you didn't have Wi-Fi, you couldn't even work. Uh, so what is what are we seeing today? We are seeing new emerging technologies, which are emerging by the day, new, new technologies, new way of working. Today, the way we are addressing each other is also the new technology that it's not really new, it was always existed, but it just got put to use during this time. Trade wars are happening across the world. Uh, we are seeing China being uh, uh, put into one side. Here's an opportunity for India to actually grow. Geopolitics, <clears throat> changing dynamics across the region. COVID-19, subsequent waves. The world is still grappling with the subsequent waves of COVID-19. We know Europe is in a bad shape. Singapore is in a bad shape. Fortunately, India is still not there. Uh, global economic slowdown. In fact, the World Bank is coming back with a new moderated growth rate for the globe. <clears throat> so the Indian economy also will be impacted by it. And of course, on the other side, we have opportunities like boundaryless growth, the boundaryless world that we are seeing and the opportunities. We have seen some industries really flourish during this particular point of time. Point of time sorry. So leadership today is being challenged. <clears throat> Leaders are forced to relook at their business models and how resilient are these business models? Can they last out? And can they manage another crisis from another wave or from any other crisis, COVID type of crisis that is going to face? So for me, the way I look at um, uh, crisis management um, and we talk of business continuity, we talk of uh, this, this is not a one-off. It is something that we will have to keep in mind and all the people who are in corporate world will understand <clears throat> how difficult it was to manage the earlier wave and one needs to be prepared to manage the 
waves as they come and as we deal with them. So what are the issues that a leadership is facing today, employee related, employee well-being, <clears throat> mental well-being of the employee itself, mental health of the employee, remote working. Today, you don't see your colleagues. It's all remote working. You see them on the screen. You don't meet them. Uh, communication has become very, very important. You know, how honest and how transparent you are in your communication and how you're able to coordinate all this. These are some things that um, uh, corporates are dealing with, employees are dealing with. As far as uh, companies are concerned, we have to reimagine cost. How do we work with alliances, the brand that we had, the brand rejuvenation, as I call it, new business models, uh, uh, the stakeholder trust, which is today at a very all time low, how do we build it back? And uh, how do we use collaboration today as a mode, model of growth, mode of growth? How do we conserve cash? In the 19, uh, uh, when we had the earlier crisis in 19, uh, um, uh, in 2008, at that time, the, there was a, a phrase which came out, cash is king. Once again, people are talking about cash being king and how do you preserve cash going forward. And some of the other challenges are operational challenges, reduced productivity, uh, supply chain issues. Supply chains have been broken as we have seen it, but it's an opportunity for India because we can now actually become part of the global supply chain, which has been badly damaged and broken. And people are looking up to India to see whether they can take the place of China in some way or will some other country do that. Technology disruption and business continuity are some things which we are seeing. <clears throat> so what is this purpose-led leadership? It acts like a guiding principle for decision makers from the boardrooms to the frontline workers, helping them move at a pace which is better than what other people will do. So in a volatile environment, how does a purpose-led leadership work? Number one, you just, you just imagine, <clears throat> why do cars have brakes? Cars have brakes so that you can drive faster. So if you have a purpose-led leadership, you will be able to move faster, you'll be able to rebound back faster, and you'll be able to grow faster. So it allows organizations to move with agility and with pace and swiftness, which is a very important uh, point for us. We all need to find our own purpose. So each of us need to find, each of the leaders need to find our own purpose and they need to be aligned with the values of the organization because the bedrock of higher purpose or the bedrock of any purpose is the values on which the bedrock is built. And <clears throat> we need to see how <clears throat> we get the entire team geared up behind us to be aligned to this commitment, to this purpose that we have got so that the organization benefits from it. Today, it is not about leaders saying, oh, after this COVID, where will our organization be? Where will we be placed? Instead of doing that, can we use purpose to be able to imagine how our organization will look post the crisis? I mean, we actually create in a positive frame that this is where I want to see my company and how do I seize the opportunity? Because with every obstacle or every single challenge which comes, there's an opportunity sitting on the other side. So how do we actually grab that opportunity uh, and use the purpose to guide the organization to that destination which we actually want to get to? For this, we need to invest in people, skill building. <clears throat> we need to build leaders. I'm sure all of us keep hearing that we keep to need, keep building our leaders and we continuously need to keep building leaders. But today it's all the more important how we build leaders and uh, uh, how do we actually use people to achieve uh, growth. In fact, I was talking to a few corporates. So we got very different stories. Some sectors are doing extremely well. Uh, I was talking to a tire company, a leading tire company in India, and they were saying that their sales have been at an all time high in their recorded history. So these are some of the positives which have come out of, um, uh, of this COVID, of this pandemic that has hit us. We also need to incentivize purpose. So how do we incentivize purpose by creating innovation, uh, encouraging people to use their ideas to help in the growth? I think the, the nice way to describe um, uh, higher purpose is by giving you a few examples. And uh, <clears throat> When we talk of, when we remember Vergi's Korean, what do we think of? We think of milk to the masses, 
the man who created these cooperative society for the first time in Gujarat and ensured that uh, the uh, cooperatives actually own the business. And I just love the motto of Amul, <clears throat> who says that they buy at the highest price and sell at the most reasonable price so that the people who supply the milk can earn the maximum money out of it. And Amul has very limited profits, but uh, it's fantastic to see the motto of how they operate, uh, the CEO of the company, the way he, uh, the ethos and the values on which he operates was um, very inspiring for me when I listened to that story, when I heard it from him personally. Uh, when we talk of, uh, when we think of AB, uh, Abdul Kalam, he's the scientist who ignited minds. So when we talk of what, what did this one individual do? He ignited minds. He fired up an entire generation of Indians from young to old to think and to do things which they think, which they thought they could not do. And when we think of Kailash Satyarthi, he returned childhood to children and he was rewarded for all this effort. The globe recognized him and gave him awards and uh, recognition. When we think of Ratan Tata, He's a business leader who operated with a higher purpose. He's a man who took Tata's global in many ways, internationalized them, and today made Tata a global brand. I want to give you an example. Uh, um, uh, uh, we were once with a very uh, big media company, which was planning expansion in India. And uh, we were doing a strategy for them. And... Uh, uh, they were uh, talking to that they wanted to do alliance with some Indian company. And when we spoke of some companies, they said, yeah, we'll have to do a due diligence. And we said, what if we get you Tata? They said, we'll sign tomorrow. So that is the brand that you build, the reputation that you build. And that uh, that's a generation of Tata we've done it, but Ratan Tata carried that torch further. When we took off, when we look at Chavi Rajwat, Rajawat, she was the MBA Sarpanch, the lady who studied MBA from abroad, came back to India and decided to go back to the roots, to the village. Uh, 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 and she actually uh, changed the way the Sarpanch system and, you know, brought a lot of process and systems into it. And also, I would say that amount of uh, um, visibility uh, where she goes and speaks at conferences and you know brought out the entire village problems what village women face etc and when we talk of Devi Shetty who's also got a connection to Calcutta he made he's making quality healthcare affordable he was one individual because I met him I've dealt with Dr. Devi Shetty he was inspired a lot by the work that Mother Teresa had done in Calcutta and he was a personal doctor so he had a very close connect with her in that extent. So when we talk of a leader with a purpose, what are we looking at? Or what are, what are the things or the qualities we look at? The leaders with purpose do the right things and not the easy wrong things. So somebody who has purpose, we're very different. You know, we have different styles, how we want to get. I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong. I'm just saying do the hard right thing and not the easy wrong thing. And I just want to give you one example out here when John F. Kennedy became the president of United States and he fired up the nation at that time to say that in 10 years from now, we want to put the first man on the moon. And he's saying not because it's an easy thing to do, but because it's a difficult thing to do. And the way he got all the Americans to believe in that dream and to believe in that mission and to move forward on it. Uh, so once when he went to NASA, it was not called NASA at that time when uh, he was there, but when he went to that NASA equivalent or whatever it was at that time, and there was a lady who was cleaning the floors and he asked her, so what are you doing? She said, I'm helping to put the first man on the moon. So this is the way, you know, leaders can actually inspire a whole lot of people and actually get them to see their vision, their dream, them, uh, and what they want to achieve. <clears throat> leaders uh, lead by example, people do what they see. So if they see a leader in a particular way, that's exactly how people will behave. So if you are finding any bad behavior in our organization, we should first look at ourselves and see how are we behaving before we uh, try and reprimand that particular individual. Leaders need to show care. They need to be humble. This is leaders with purpose I'm talking. They need to show care. They need to be humble. 
and help as many people achieve their goals. As many people as possible achieve their goals, they need to be passionate about what they do. And they need to create value for the greater good. And they need to be in service of others. You may have heard of servant leadership. If you are in service of others, um, I like to quote Albert Einstein out here who says the highest destiny of the individual is to serve rather than to rule. And I think that is a great leader. If you look at most great leaders, they behave, their humility is their biggest weapon. And uh, you'll, be, you'll be shocked when you meet them, the way they talk to you, the way they speak to you. It's just like a, your friend you're meeting and there is no qualms because their greatness precedes them. They don't need to talk about it. You need to touch as many lives as you can <clears throat> because at the end of it, people are not going to ask you, what's your bank balance? Uh, how many cars you own, how many houses you own. They're just going to ask you one question, how many lives have you touched? And I think that's very, very important. And you need to influence and inspire people to actually do great things. And that's what a leader is meant to do. So when we talk of purpose-driven organizations, and uh, so if you look at the most successful brands that are there, the most successful brands, they are not there just to make profits. Yes, profit is one of the items, because without profit, you can't do anything. But they are built around a purpose, around a mission, around ideals, around what they want to do for the larger good of society or uh, what they want. So when a company uh, works out, for example, at KPMG, when I was there, we wrote out a higher purpose. And I was part of that team from International, which actually worked on the higher purpose for the global organization. So when a company wants to define its higher purpose, it has to go back to its roots, to its founding fathers, as to what was the ethos and why did they set up this organization? Because in a growth of an organization, many times a lot of these things are forgotten and you go back to the roots and understand why you exist or why did this organization come in place and can we rekindle that flame and burn that, uh, you know, get that to burn brightly. And so you need to revisit your values and understand how they can be implemented in the current world in which we live in. So, uh, so corporates <clears throat> earlier <clears throat> used to create value creation for its own sake. I mean, profit for its own shareholders. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> but today they are building value for and with a wider set of stakeholders. So it's no more about just shareholders now. There's an entire list of stakeholders which need to be dealt with. So you need to create value for the customer. You need to positively impact the society in which you live in. We know youngsters join companies today. When an interview happens, you don't know who's interviewing who because the youngster wants to know, okay, listen, what are you doing for society? What are you doing on ESG? What are you doing on giving back to society? So these are a lot of questions being asked to corporates and they are doing a lot of soul searching and saying, how do we actually get to become more responsible business? How do we run more responsible business? And generating financial return for stakeholders is one of the items because uh, shareholders, when they come in, they need a return for all the money that they have put in. And you'll always find that purpose-driven organizations, it has been empirically proved and there are enough results to prove it. Greater employee satisfaction, better customer advocacy, and higher quality of products and services. Because when a bunch of people are very happy, if you look at the Southwest Airlines CEO, what he said, he said, uh, what I do is work on keeping my staff happy. Because if my staff are happy, my customers will be happy because there'll be a happy bunch of people who are serving customers. So I think people need to understand that the biggest asset they have is people and how are they going to treat these people and how are they going to get the best out of the people. So leaders need to look at that. One great example of a purpose-driven organization is Apple. And uh, you all know the story of Steve Jobs. I'm going to tell you the story of Steve Jobs. But it's an organization which, uh, if, what does Apple do? It makes computers, it makes phones like most other companies do. They've got, uh, they've got access to the same consultants which everybody else has. They have everything else which everybody else has. But why are they different? Because the owner, the promoter of the company, Steve Jobs actually believed in a vision saying that I've come into this world to make a dent. And when I come into the world to make a dent, otherwise I might as well not have lived. And he brought products, he brought 
Um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen an Apple live launch, uh, especially when Steve Jobs was there, even now when Tim Cook, pretty decent. Uh, but when Steve Jobs, the entire aura that he had created around it, and just look at it, what he has created through getting people to believe in the brand, in uh, the people who work there, uh, they, they go beyond the call of duty, the quality of the product that they produce. You know, Apple is one phone, which uh, is got a closed system. But, you know, if you, whenever I look, I mean, there could be other cases, but whenever I look, I find that the Apple phones are the least uh, attacked through cyber than any other phone that is there. So obviously it's something he's got right, something that he has done right. And he keeps innovating and bringing out new products. When he brought the iPad, people said it's going to fail. Uh, <clears throat> when he brought the watch, it's going to fail. And today you see where all these items are. They are on the top of the charts. And um, uh, okay, you can see you can see it that I'm an Apple fan. Uh, so um, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the products that I use uh, from Apple. And their employees are dedicated and he's made them ask the question as to why do they get up in the morning? Why do they work in, a, in Apple where they work? Why do they serve the customers whom they serve? If you have ever gone down to an Apple store in the New York, in the main flagship store on Fifth Avenue, uh, you will see the quality of service. You know, you will understand what sales mean. And I can recall one incident. I went there when the Apple Watch was launched. And I just walked in there and I told him, see, listen, I don't want to buy the watch, but I just wanted, I was fascinated to see what this watch was. He said, don't worry. I'm going to explain this entire watch to you. And he took the entire trouble of explaining as if he's going to sell this watch to me, but he knew I was not going to buy it. And uh, yet he did not do anything which was different. So the way, and <clears throat> it was known that the Apple store at Fifth Avenue generated more sales per square foot than any other retail store anywhere in America. So, you know, there were certain things that he got right. He was very clear in his um, mission and the quality that he wanted and he drove people to achieve the impossible. Uh, <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> you may say he was a very nasty individual. He had his, but then he was a genius. And that genius let people continue to work with him and be part of the team because they wanted to be, uh, uh, I don't know whether you know this story when he was hiring um, uh, John Skilling from uh, Pepsi, which Pepsi was a top company that time in the US. Uh, and he was hiring him into Apple, which was a complete startup. And he told John Skilling, do you want to sell sugar water all your life or do you want to create history? And that's what swung John Skilling to join Apple. But it was unfortunate that John Skilling fired Steve Jobs from Apple. And then Steve Jobs got back and, you know, rest is history. You don't need to say it. But these are how great leaders come up, how great leaders get born. Their mission doesn't die. The fire inside them continues to burn brightly. And <clears throat> if you have not had the opportunity of seeing the latest movie on Steve Jobs, which is on Netflix, I would recommend you to see it. It's nothing about Apple. It's more about Steve Jobs, the man. It'll be a good movie to see. <clears throat> I enjoyed seeing that movie. I would recommend it to anybody who, who actually believes in Steve Jobs, of course. So you want to be a great leader. I think you need to ask yourself a few questions. And I'm going to put these questions to you because it's for you to introspect and think, am I there? Am I actually getting it? Or is there some things I need to do to become the great leader that I aspire to become? Are you agile? Very important in today's time. And do you grab opportunities when they come? Do you collaborate by design? Are you adaptable to changes? So are you flexible? Are you, do you have flexibility that yes, you can go from one to another and not get stuck on something else? Do you embrace, embrace diversity? Very important in today's time. Diversity is uh, become so important in how we operate in today's time. So do you embrace diversity and just not mouth it, but you actually live it? Do you lead by example? Are you a role model? <clears throat> do people look up to you when people see you? I'll tell you, <clears throat> it's very easy to go and put your values on a screensaver or put them in the cafeteria or put them on computers, etc. 
but you need to live the values which you talk about or which the organization talk about. Do people count on your word? Very important. And are you becoming an expert in an area? Are you becoming a master in one particular area? What will you be known for in a few years from now? Will people remember you for anything? That's why, what are you famous for? What will you become famous for? And uh, <clears throat> the other last question that I think one should ask themselves, are you customer centric? Are you working for your customer to keep your customer delighted and happy? Here, I would like to tell you a, a very short story, but a story that um, has inspired me for many, many years. The story of Jamshed G. Tata, the person who founded the Tata Empire. He laid the foundation on the values on which Tata was built. And the group has been truly living those values for more than a century. And in his own words, in a free enterprise, the community is not just another stakeholder in business but is in fact the very purpose of its existence. And these are the words of Mr. Tata, the founder of the Tata Empire. And what was his purpose? His purpose was always greater good, caring for people. I've read this story about when he was putting up the Tata steel plant, which actually was not put up by him, but he had envisioned that plant coming up and he had wrote a mail to his son, telling him how the plant should come. And some basic things like there should be good living quarters for the workers, there should be schools, there should be temples, there should be mosques, there should be churches, there should be good medical facilities, there should be good schools. So he envisioned a society where people, his people are going to work for Tata's are going to be happy and Jamshedpur I think is a great example of what came out uh, of a vision of a visionary out there. And if you know the story of Tata's, they are the ones who have brought all the rules that we have today, whether it's Provident Fund, whether it's gratuity, whether it's pregnancy leave, whether it's eight hours working, whether it is bonus, they are the ones who started it before they were laws. They, they brought it out and ultimately the country adopted it and everybody followed it. Leaders lead by example, rest follow. <clears throat> he never attached any commercial value to his purpose. Never, he never attached any commercial value. He believed in high quality products and services. That was his motto. And also, I do not know how many of you picked it up, but Jamshedji Tata is today listed in the global list of the top 10 philanthropists from the last hundred years. And he's number one in that. So uh, for the kind of philanthropy, and I was reading somewhere where they said, okay, uh, you know, uh, this Bill Gates has put so much money, others have put so much money, but Tata's didn't wait to make profit to give, to give back to society. They gave as they earned and they have truly lived their value and not built personal wealth, but built wealth for the nation, for, the, uh, for their employees, for the, uh, for the larger society and the country at large. There's so many stories about them, but it's an inspiring, uh, group uh, and people who have worked there will know what I'm talking about. And then uh, the other point that I want to cover today is the how do you embed your purpose and values in your leadership style? And uh, one of the things that I learned uh, very, I mean, I got the meaning of it. Uh, I mean, all of us do follow it, but many times words get meaning when you work in particular organizations. When I worked in Arthur Anderson, it believed in the, uh, in the spirit of stewardship. That means you hold something in trust to give it to somebody uh, better than what you got it. So when we became partners or when I became an international partner in Arthur Anderson, we were told that you're holding this in trust to give it back to the next bunch of partners better than what you got it. And we tried to live that. So the question that we all need to ask ourselves, are we creating a legacy of stewardship? Very important. Are we connecting with our employees? Do we even walk down the bay? Do we pat somebody on the back? Do we tell them great job done? Do you put purpose before profit? That's the question we all need to ask ourselves. Do you make in leaving a deep lasting positive impact in all your discussions, in all your interactions with people, whoever they may be, however big or small they may be? Are you willing to work selflessly? Do you help others succeed? Leaders need to help others succeed, not succeed themselves, but how do they help others succeed? 
do you believe in giving back to society? You know, one very simple philosophy. I don't know. It's so simple that I wonder whether anybody will even want to. Uh, uh, you know, I was just thinking each of us who live in the middle class, if we can just help five people, and if we have 200 million people in the middle class, 200, 250 million, there are different numbers floating around. I mean, we just help five people, we would have touched a billion lives. And I think that is important. So um, it's not, you know, when we break down a problem, it's not as huge as it looks. But we all have to do our small bit of giving back to society, about being in service to others. You know, um, I was reading this, um, uh, this um, uh, one of these famous um, authors uh, and uh, television who said that, you know, we all... <clears throat> aspire uh, to be famous and wealthy. Fame and wealth, according to her, it fades with time. But if we are in service of others, we will far outlive our own life and people will remember us long after we are gone. So being in service of others is, uh, is good because you leave an impact on society. Are you emotionally engaged? Do people around you trust you? The one uh, this thing which I have is that trust can only be broken once. And once it's broken, it's broken. There's nothing else that can be done. That mark and scar will remain forever. Are you fair in all your dealings with everybody, whether it is promotions, whether it is the way you compensate them or the way you deal with them? And what is your personal perception of integrity and ethics? How do you look at it? I'm not going to give a lecture. I'm not going to be moralistic out here, but and are you, are you viewed as a pretender? Are you viewed as a pretender or are you authentic? Very important. People can see authenticity. They can see an authentic leader and they can see a pretender. And I can tell you the authentic leader, the pretender will be called out at some time faster than later. He can survive for some time. Let me be clear. They do, they do last out sometimes longer than needed, but they will be called out at some time. Um, and are you adding personal meaning to higher purpose? Are you giving a personal sense of direction to this higher purpose in your own organization before you go about uh, doing it for others? <clears throat> so, you know, when I look at even a leader like Mahatma Gandhi, who was the father of the nation, who is the father of the nation, who led our non-violence movement, who actually gave meaning to non-violence, and he's quoted by so many people even today, uh, he's a universal leader, what we call a universal leader, because there are leaders who are liked and disliked, but Mahatma Gandhi was one leader who the whole world believes in, trusts, and actually takes him as a role model. So when he spoke about corporation, he's saying the purpose of a corporation, Gandhi argued that companies should act as trusteeships, valuing social responsibility alongside profit. He was a visionary even understood how corporate should work long before we talk of stewardship. If I use, look at all what the words he used, this is what we use today in our modern, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, this thing. So I think, uh, <clears throat> so Mahatma Gandhi is a great role model that we can have. Then when we look at ourselves, when we look at our communities are asking very, very tough questions today. Today, it is not about being legally right. It is about being ethically right. The moral compass has to become the order of the day. Today, it's no more saying, okay, I'm doing this planning or I'm doing this because it is legally right. I'm legally allowed to do this. But you need to ask yourself, is it ethically right what I'm doing? So legally, you can do many things. The law allows you many things, but you have to ask your, answer yourself this question. And this is where the conflict of interest comes in. This is where people need to ask ourselves. And leaders who have a purpose, who have a higher purpose, go beyond that. Uh, in life, there'll be a lot of temptations for all of us. We will find a lot of shortcuts. But I can tell you something. Many times these shortcuts turn out to be long cuts because nothing is life is achieved without hard work and without that. So without hard work, nothing will ever be achieved. And uh, <clears throat> I want to talk about the spirit of stewardship because this is something that is very, very, this like higher purpose is also close to my heart. Because um, when we talk of stewardship, 
when we are saying we want to leave this place a better place than we found it, leave the world a better place than we found it, or leave the organization in a better place than what we found it, then we need to work hard because when you hold something in trust as a trustee to be handed over to somebody else, it's not yours. It is there temporarily. The problem with all of us, we are trying to find permanence in a temporary world. No titles are permanent. <clears throat> The way I look at it, titles are earned, and sorry, titles are given, but respect is earned. We need to earn the respect of the people through the work we do. We can have any title, we can be CEO, we can be chairman, but we have to earn the respect of the people through our own hard work, through how we conduct ourselves, how we actually behave in society. So, you know, the, I, have a, I have a simple uh, circle of life. All the people that you meet on your way up are the same people you meet on your way down. You treat these people with respect on your way up. They will treat you with respect on your way down. And if you treat them differently, your journey down is going to be very rough as much as you made their life rough. So, you know, as we grow in organizations, I see, you know, some people have a very fast track and they just move on. They ignore their colleagues. You never know in life when uh, the, uh, tide, the tide changes and titles change and or you move to a different organization where the person who was your junior is today your boss. So it, I mean, what does it take to respect somebody, even if he cannot do anything for you? Um, I mean, I'm just saying the office boy, you know, so just about how you treat everybody uh, with respect. Uh, everybody has a name. Everybody needs to be called by their name. And how much does it cost us to actually bring a smile on somebody's face who comes there? I was talking to a startup the other day. Uh, <clears throat> he was telling me that even when they welcome, uh, it's a new startup. It's about one year old. So even when a delivery boy joins, joins, they have a big welcome for him. They put his picture up. They talk about him. So everybody knows that this person. So they bring an identity to an individual. Um, uh, they bring an identity to the individual and I think that's what, uh, 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 what, what is important. So I was reading somewhere, uh, this was the Black Cats, New Zealand rugby team, where their coach said, always leave the jersey in a better place. So each of you get a jersey to wear because you wear it for your country. So leave the jersey in a better place than what you got it. And um, in the same place, I think in that book I read, be a good ancestor, plant trees that you'll never see. And this was a story I read about these trees, you know, that there was this old man who was planting trees and this village boy was saying that, you know, you're so old, you will die before this tree even grows. He said, when I came into this world, there were a lot of trees here. So somebody planted it. I'll plant these trees so somebody else can enjoy the shade. So I think it's about being, uh, uh, being, uh, you know, being good citizens about being looking after society. And I, I would like to end with my favorite words, live life in such a way that when tomorrow comes and you are not here, how would you like to be remembered? Uh, thank you very much for listening to me and the patience y'all have showed. I'm happy to take any questions if there are anything. Yes, sir. Uh, we do. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. It was nice listening to you. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, sure. Uh, 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 as you can see that there are a few people seeing here, but there are also a few more seeing on the YouTube. Sure. I'll start with a few questions on YouTube. This is a person. It's a, it's an interesting question. I'll just put it. It's, it has sure. no political implications. He has already said, but I'm just putting it up. It is by a person. Uh, he's M. Veluchami. He has asked, uh, he has in fact given two questions. I'll repeat one by one. The first one is, is it at all possible, even in literary senses, to collaborate with China? In that case, our border mysteries and our troubles with borders may be over and maybe we can reach a new height. What do you think about it? Uh, see, uh, uh, honestly, if you ask me, uh, there are political compulsions. Uh, today, if you are, today, you know, our trade, just for everybody's knowledge, our trade with China has doubled after all these uh, border disputes, okay? So uh, uh, China is, uh, is a great power. Uh, I mean, they have economically very strong. 
but we are reading the story that is the china story up i don't know there are many uh, you know people uh, i was talking to the ceo of the china practice of kpmg he's saying china was never as great as the world made it out to be and china is not as bad as the world makes it out to be so he defined it in that way uh, so i think collaborating uh, i'm not sure collaborating with china will get us too much honestly because we are very strong in our services and i think we need to we need to work to our strengths and we need to build a good ecosystem where we can become part of the globe see we were never part of global supply chain we need to become part of global supply chain all global supply chains are broken and today we are seeing shortage and we are finding inflation in the world because there is no supply there is more demand and less supply uh, i don't know whether you picked up the article of the economist which said that us today has the highest retail trade even in pre covid period even outstrip pre covid period so this shows that uh, you know people are spending people are wanting to buy and i think india can become part of this global supply chain uh, india has got the uh, tenacity it has got the ability it's got the uh, manpower uh, we just need to get good government policies on the ground which will help manufacturing companies uh, the make in india story actually come true and uh, here's an opportunity so whether we collaborate with china or not collaborate with china i think we will be in competition with china uh, but china is so big uh, you know compared to us uh, they are what uh, we are um, a 3 trillion economy they are 15 trillion so th there's a huge difference in the economy size and you know what we are talking about but uh, i would still say collaboration with um, uh, with more countries will always be helpful in in the way we grow but i think india has an opportunity to come up yeah thank you sir uh, yeah next question is from mr jodhi dotto he has asked uh, how conflict management can be done in modern day industry and better collaboration in society as the philanthropist like jamshed ji tata did is it so <laughs> so i always believe that if we do the right thing things will fall in place Uh, uh, you may not uh, you may not uh, become a rocket but you know what a rocket is right a rocket goes up and comes down very fast uh, so you can definitely grow and if we do the right things our growth can also be much better today we have seen global brands which have been destroyed which have been wound up which have gone into chapter 11 and all the companies that actually had a strong sense of purpose or a strong this thing have bounced back faster than other companies uh, i think conflict management is something which is i'm not sure many people even understand it honestly you know when i look around the country see the way the judiciary operates or even the parliament operates i don't under, i don't think they understand what is conflict management but when i talk of corporates it's very difficult today many times to deal with it but i would always say do the right things uh, you see how the world has come around uh today the oecd has come out with taxes that there has to be a level playing field across all countries so they're bringing a minimum tax anywhere you are so there can be no income that can escape tax now so the, all these tax havens will now uh, will have a very limited use or very minor use than what it is so all these catch up you know all these new new things which we try catches up that's why i said it's about being ethically right and uh, and i've lived my life on those terms and uh, i don't want to come and give you examples of what i personally did when i was running the india firm or not but i think it's about doing the right thing and being able to sleep in the night with your conscience because that forget anything else forget what the world talks about you you have to deal with your own conscience and say whether you did the right thing or not thank you sir uh, i'll take two more questions uh, yeah. one is would you say that there is a particular rule book for becoming a good leader there is no rule book i would just say your rule book should be your own mind and say that uh, uh, that uh, uh, if you were on the other side would you expect the same treatment and uh, you know when you deal with any situation how would you like to be treated please treat the other person in the same way if you treat the other person in the same way you would be able to you know uh, i think achieve that so Uh, so i would say there's no rule book it's just about following your values uh, which we have all been brought up on and uh, you know and uh, 
living those values actually and just not talking about it but just living those values you don't need to talk about values you people can see it so you don't need to advertise it yeah yeah sorry uh, and the last question i would take uh, it is basically from a student's point of view uh, they would really like to know though this has nothing not much to do with this today's uh, topic but still i'll ask you because it seems that they are eager to know is it at all possible to make it big without going to top iits that is a very small question but i think it is very relevant for them okay uh if i give you my own story uh, i started in a small medium size firm i was not the most brilliant student i never went to any iim i never went to any great management school uh, it's about how you learn on the job and how you are able to use god's given gift which is common sense how you are able to connect the dots and make a life you know because ultimately you know when you go to work i know the first job may be difficult to get um, i mean it today if you are not in the top i am and you are competing with somebody there obviously that guy most probably will be selected but it doesn't mean from wherever you work um i mean i uh, the 12 years of my life i spent uh, 12 or 13 years of my life i spent in a spent in a medium sized firm small national firm and then joined arthur anderson but that did not stop me from becoming the ceo of a big four and uh, you know against uh, competition so it's a very competitive world out there uh, um, and uh, each one of us gets an opportunity it depends uh, the one thing that you need to do is work hard work smart get a good mentor in your life early in your life a mentor teaches i was very lucky to get a mentor very early in my life and i think a mentor will do wonders for you for all the students i would also tell you one more thing that uh, uh, you know uh, always every time you are doing something just put 10% extra every time you are doing something now do 10% extra after uh, every time you are doing so keep improving don't go for those big improvements 10% that's all 10% better again 10% better it's about going out there work hard put your head down remain focused live in the present don't uh, think about the past whatever great you are you are that's gone it's history future will come to you you work hard now in the present the future will be yours and the one more thing i'll tell the students as they are there never sell anything that you would not buy never sell anything that you would not buy and always <clears throat> remember destiny is in your hand remain in the driver's seat and and i can assure you you will do well as you go up people will value what you bring to the table skills are not today marketing finance accounting skills are now based on the industry in which you work in e-commerce what is the skill you have in e-commerce you will be hired for those skills so the skill is on the job and i think that is more important and i think i feel in today's time students get a better opportunity entrepreneurship there are startups uh, there are wonderful ways in which i didn't have all those i mean we had a simple thing either you join this or that but now i think students have a much better opportunity to actually do well and uh, grow in fact you all are living in very exciting times i would say mr reki you are uh, one of the most respected voice in the world of consulting consulting okay just i would like to extend extend uh, the questions of anirvan okay uh, what are the key competencies that the aspiring uh, consultant should look into uh, yeah what this is, is this is industry best still as yes. a whole what are the competencies they should i mean skill up please so uh, so first of all you need to be innovative in your thinking you need to uh, you always need to find a better way of doing things there's a particular way to do things how can you do it better so creative mindset critical thinking uh, the, the ability to uh, <clears throat> to find solutions a positive mindset to a problem see because one of the biggest things which consultants will face will be failure and the question will come how do you deal with failure uh, let me tell you my biggest learnings came in my failure i could have given up i could have said fine i uh, you know gone let me now resign and go and get another job but it is also about how you deal with failure and you can bounce back in consulting and uh, consulting is a very tough if you're talking consulting as a profession it's a very hard life let me tell you and you know it it is a life in which 
uh, you know, somebody asked me, what is work-life balance? There's nothing known as work-life balance. I say, try to find work-life harmony where you can work a little smarter and be able to do the best with your time. And uh, I would say uh, critical thinking, your ability to find, uh, provide positive. You see, what are clients looking for? They're looking for solutions, right? Clients are looking for solutions and you should be able to provide solutions to the client. No point knowing the law. Anybody can read the law. But how do you provide a solution to a client? I think these will be the skill sets which will differentiate one consultant from another, which will differentiate a good consultant from a normal consultant. And I think, uh, and also one very important point, uh, relationship building. I didn't talk about it, but I, your young students, they asked, you know, we should learn to build relationships. What we build is transactions. We uh, Today I come to you because I need something from you. But do I build a relationship with you? Even I don't need something, do I ever come to you and meet you, talk to you, ask you what your problems are? Life is about give and take. I think we should we should be takers. I'm not saying no, but we should also be givers. It's all give and take. And the more we give, the more we'll get. So uh, I would for, and this is for everybody, just not students, but students are out there. Students, he, uh, Anibar said about the students. So I think givers and takers is very important for them. <clears throat> As they grow up, they are youngsters. They need to make their lives. We have, okay. I've at least, my one first innings are over. <laughs> <laughs> so nice, Edward. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we do come to a, to, to a close of, uh, we don't want to close it. We would like to hear more from you, but uh, maybe we'll keep it for the next time. No. Uh, so we are joined here by Mr. Vibhut Tandon, who is also a joint treasurer at Calcutta Management Association. Sure. Sure. Uh, May I request Mr. Tandon to kindly propose the formal vote of thanks. Uh, Mr. Tandon, to you, please. Yeah, it is in fact a, a pleasure, a great pleasure on my part to be able to, uh, you know, be given this opportunity to uh, extend my thanks to uh, Richard, sir. As a matter of fact, I would say this is uh, by far one of the best uh, deliberations that I would have heard when it comes to leadership. And as I believe, in, in all spheres of life, you know, be it personal life, be it professional life, be it a student life, or be it at the helm of management or even in politics, I believe, and I think even Richard Sir believes, that leadership is the core, is at the core of everything. And, and when Richard Sir has talked about it in such a simple and elaborate manner, elaborate, comprehensive, yet simple, and I believe probably some of the most efficient, some of the most beautiful things that he talked about, as he mentioned in the end, uh, which I really loved was being a giver. So givers and takers, when he said that be a taker, but only when you are a giver, you'll actually be able to take elaborately in life and you'll be able to relish what you're taking in life. I believe, I've always believed uh, uh, on, on a personal and a professional level that seeds, which we always sow in, in different areas of our life, uh, really blossom into and grow up into beautiful trees and finally fruits, which, which everybody is able to relish. A part of it always comes to you. So I believe today, uh, Mr. Richard Reiki has sowed some very relevant, beautiful and long lasting seeds into our minds, be it professionals or be it students, and it is going, going to go a long way to really uh, grow up into wonderful, lovely trees, which will create different kinds of fruits into your lives in different areas of life of yours. With this, I would like to extend my thanks to uh, Mr. Richard Ricky to have you know, given such a wonderful leadership lecture, which was an experience. I would say it was more of an experience than learning because every time you listen to somebody, you learn something, but every time you're engrossed into something, you experience it, you become what the other person is saying. And I would really love to thank uh, Richard, sir, Mr. Richard Reiki to have uh, you know, given a wonderful deliberation. And uh, I will look forward to, and we hope that we will meet again and we will love to hear and experience more from you. Thank you so much, sir.
I would also I, extend uh, thank you so much. I would love I would, to come to Calcutta. Uh, Calcutta is my weakness. I said, and if when things open up a little more, come and we do a live session. You know, whenever yeah, yeah. you like it. And also for some people who are asking for my connects, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, and I'm very happy to. You know, I I will I will not disregard your <laughs> invitations. I will connect with you. So yeah. Yeah. So kind of you. So kind of yeah. you, sir. So uh, we we extend uh, uh, our, our heartfelt gratitude and thanks to Mr. Re Mr. Richard Reiki to have uh, graced the occasion and deliver this beautiful uh, leadership lecture. Thank you so much, sir. We extend our. Uh, I would like to also extend on on behalf of Calcutta Management Association our sincere thanks to all the audience you know, who have come in from different fields, and it's a really uh, you know. a uh, wonderful attendance that we have today despite having so many sessions nowadays online in the evening we have wonderful sure. attendance coming in and we would like to extend our heartfelt thanks to all of you who have attended this lecture and made this initiative successful uh, and with this on behalf of uh, on on behalf of calcutta management associations uh, executive committee i would like to uh, welcome all of you at a different opportunity again look forward to see you again Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.